Hi, I'm Rainey Aronson. I am the executive producer and editor in chief of Frontline, and we are produced out of GBH, and it's a pleasure to be with you all today. I have to just say out loud that this is an amazing honor for me to be moderating this wonderful panel with some remarkable young women, and it's really going to be a great conversation. This is a really important event brought to you in partnership by GBH's high school quiz show and the World Channel. I wanted to just note that I love questions, so the more the better. And if you could put your questions, if you look below you, there's a Q&A box. You can just drop them in there anytime. And likely I'll be going back and forth between my own questions of this remarkable panel, but also your own, so that we can really have an interactive conversation. So I just want to share that I am a former debater from rural Vermont. And as a young person, high school debater, I was a policy debater, and um, as a young woman, it was one of the most important parts of my high school education, but also my education and being in the world. And when people ask me, why do I work at Frontline and why do I love running Frontline, I oftentimes go back to my debate days because that was really where I learned that there are multiple sides to a story. There are multiple ways of thinking about stories. And especially in the world of journalism today, where we try to be nonpartisan, it's really important to have leadership and producers and journalists who really want to hear each other, have debate, healthy debate, and also just acknowledge that we don't all have the same point of view and how important it is for our democracy to have healthy, active, and um, debates across the board. So when they asked me to, to come and moderate this, I was thrilled. So don't forget to put your questions in the Q&A box and I'll be there looking for them. So first, I wanna just say that the film Girl Talk is an incredible documentary. We're gonna show you a clip in a moment, but I wanted to invite two of the director, Lucia Small's friends on with me right now. Um, unfortunately, Lucia is not with us today. She um, unfortunately died of pancreatic cancer, but she did finish this film and she had a remarkable collaboration with two women who are gonna join me right now, uh, Rachel Clark and Jennifer Pearson. And hopefully they'll come on. Hi, Jennifer. Hi, Rachel. Hi. Hi. Thank you. Thank you for joining me. And as a filmmaker myself and also someone who really admires this film, thank you for joining me to talk about Lucia, her work and her dedication to this film and anything that you want to share about her remarkable body of work. I'll start with you, Jennifer. Um, well, I met Lucia probably back in 2002 or 2003. We were both working out of the same production office. And just on a personal level, she I connected with her. She was a type of person that you connect with immediately because she was very genuine, very curious, uh, smart and funny, all qualities that I think make an excellent um, documentary filmmaker. And then I saw her very first film, My Father the Genius, fell in love with it, thought, my God, this is really unique. This is funny. This is amazing. And, and still holds up today, even though it was made almost 20 years ago. Um, and then we bumped into each other a lot over the years and never really worked together until this last, her, her last film. Um, unfortunately, she was getting tired. You know, she was under undergoing treatment for pancreatic cancer, no joke, pretty, pretty severe. And she just needed some help to like push this film over the finish line. And she was dedicated to do that. Um, you know, parsing her time between, you know, spa days and then, you know, edit room days. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. I, I think she and and the and the girls from the film who will who will join later can I'm sure pile on to this that she created such a warm, inviting, and open and collaborative environment, and I think that really allowed for this film to be the film that it is for these young girls, vulnerable, ambitious, et cetera, to feel comfortable really sharing all of that and. Um, yeah, that's just who she was as a person and who she was as a filmmaker were not that different, you know, just she she just lived those qualities. So yeah, miss her very much. Oh, thank you. I, I really appreciate that you would come and share about her because of course we're going to be talking about her film. We're going to be hearing from two of the women who are in her film. And I just was so touched and moved by her film. Okay, so now Rachel, you were the editor of this amazing film. Could you just share what your thoughts are on the film, but also on Lucia as well? Um, yeah, um, 
I, I was going to sort of similarly speak to the way that Lucia had that ability to connect with people. You know, we were close friends for many years and, you know, you feel like you connect with her in a, a way that rarely happens in life and then find out that she actually connects with a lot of people that way, which is why she had more friends than anyone I know. Um, and she's had this ability to really sort of um, suck the marrow out of life and really enjoy whatever she was doing. And that included working on this film. Um, and we had a lot of fun putting this film together. Um, and I would say about this film, um, she was really interested in the resonance of the female voice and how it's received in relation to male voices. Um, she always said that she was a feminist from the age of five. Um, and all her other films were first person nonfiction. Um, her first film was about her father. And then the next two were she made with the filmmaker Ed Pincus. And because she was in these films alongside her father and then Ed, I think she always felt keenly how differently she was judged in relation in versus the male characters in the films. Um, and then with her last film, Girl Talk, obviously she wasn't in it, but it was an incredibly personal film for her because it speaks to something she struggled with her whole life. Um, and um, I also wanted to say that, you know, the fact that she worked right up until the end on this film, she knew she was running out of time, but she wanted to do something to inspire younger generations. Um, and she was always interested in that point where girls either speak up or shut down. And she wanted to talk, get that conversation going with them about bias and implicit bias. Um, so they understood earlier what was going on. Um, and then just one last thing I wanted to say was that um, her previous film, the film she made before this one with Ed Pincus, One Cut, One Life, um, he's diagnosed with a terminal illness in that film. And one of the themes is what would you do if you had one year to live? And I just wanted to say that the fact that she spent her last years working on this film speaks volumes, I think. Yeah. She was literally on the West Coast screening this film, going to screenings up and down the West Coast, you know, three weeks before she passed, she was, you know, toughing it out, like heroically toughing it out because she really wanted to get this film out. And she, nothing gave her strength and energy, like standing in front of an audience after a screening. Well, thank you both for sharing that. It's, it's really beautiful. And I really did want to take a moment to center her and her work and her legacy and to just say thank you to both of you for that. And also just for keeping her film alive. So with that, I would love to show a trailer of the film because it's really powerful. And I hope all of you in the audience will take time after this, if you haven't seen the whole film, to really spend some time with her work and her prior work because she's a really remarkable filmmaker. So let's watch the trailer now. Thank you, Jennifer and Rachel. Judge ready? Great, let's begin. Starting now. This concedes our third link to our case. Step into the world of competitive debate. Is equality. Debate is perception, especially public forum, where even though you have two confident debaters, you put them side by side. And that's really where a power dynamic is formed in the minds of a judge. In a soccer game, if you score two goals, you won. Whereas in debate, it's very, very subjective. But victory does not always go to the best debater. A judge told me, like, your voice is too feminine for debate. At that point, I was like, how can I control my voice? Like, I literally was born with it. Stand up tall, no slouching. Glue your feet to the ground, pretend they're sticky glue. Lower your voice at the end of your sentences. Don't trail off. Don't interrupt boys. They give you all these tips and tricks, right? Which is BS. The, you know, the problem is not us, the problem is the judges. The judge is just gonna vote for who looks like a winner. Looking like a winner oftentimes isn't very feminine. <laughs> 
In this high school, the girls on debate team have a new strategy. Will it work? It comes from us, right? We coach each other. We all see ourselves as maybe the ones who can change things. Girl Talk on Local USA. Watch on World Channel and in the PBS app. So it's pretty exciting. We have two people from that film with us on the panel tonight, as well as two remarkable women who are um, part of the high school quiz show. So I'd love you all to come on camera now and I'll introduce you. It's really a pleasure to see you all. Thank you for joining me and thanks for the, the great conversation we're about to have. So let's start with Gabby. Gabby Lewis is in the film. She's a Curtin senior at Tufts University studying poli-sci, which is near and dear to my heart, Gabby, which you know. Uh, she graduated from Newton South High School in 2019, and she was a member of the debate team for all four years of her time at Newton South. She competed competitively and was the co-state champion for Massachusetts Public Forum debate in 2018. As a senior, she focused her energy on coaching novices in debate, which I just love about your bio, Gabby. As a tough student, she is very involved in a club for promoting youth civic engagement, which we all know we need a lot more of right now. Hannah Fenn is also featured in Girl Talk. Hannah, thanks for joining us. Um, at the height of her debate career, she was ranked second in the country with her debate partner and best friend, Daniel Abdullah, which is amazing you guys stayed best friends. That's cool. Afterward, she studied at Harvard and applied mathematics, minoring in computational neuroscience and ran a small market research startup. Sophie Noreen is a senior at North Quincy High School in Quincy, Massachusetts. You're going to see her in a clip in a little bit. She is a vice president of her school's academic decathlon club, president of the debate club, and a class representative for senior student student council. Outside of school, Sophie has participated in the Grub Street Young Adult Writers Fellowship, which I really want to learn more about Sophie after this, and was awarded a silver key in poetry and the Scholastic Art and Writing Awards. Dominique Dang is a senior in North Quincy High School. She's interested in studying computer science and biology in college. She started our, her school's first Girls Who Code Club, which is a super inspiring club, to encourage more female students to learn about computer science. She's also part of the Academic Decathlon Club, Quiz Bowl Team, and Music Program program in Quincy. Outside of school, she says she enjoys coding projects at hackathons, conducting research in the lab, and volunteering at museums and science events. Okay, you're remarkable young people. I love that you're here tonight. And let's watch a little from the next clip and then have a conversation. And please, everyone in the audience, please put your questions in as you hear more from these young women. Coming up on High School Quiz Show, it's the quarterfinals with North Quincy High School. <laughs> Taking on Brookline High School. That's next on High School Quiz Show. Competing for North Quincy, we have Caitlin, Peter, John Thomas, and Dominique, with alternates Sophie and Nicholas, and coaches Peggy Farron, Mira Kriz, and Danielle Fernandez. What Egyptian astronomer who lived in Alexandria in the second century AD wrote about a geocentric or Earth-centered model of the universe? Yes, Dominique. Ptolemy? Yes. Yes, Dominique. Gamma? Gamma rays, correct. Yes, Dominique. Primary? Correct. Yes, Dominique. Mosquito? Correct. Yes, Dominique. Stella Luna? Correct. In 2022, at age 81, who announced he was stepping down as director of the National Institute of Allergy? Yes. Fauci? Dr. Anthony Fauci. The pancreas secretes what hormone that, yes? Insulin? Yes. What single thing do you believe every person should experience in their lifetime and why? I would say a cross-country road trip because there's so much to see and not enough time to do it all. Very good idea.
Well, I, I said when I first saw that high school quiz show that I was completely intimidated by the knowledge, Dominique. I, I honestly, and Sophie, it's really amazing. So I wanted to start with a couple of questions around the sort of nature of competition and your own expectations, but also maybe your friends and family's expectations. Um, looking at how high achieving you've all been, I, I just wanted to start right with like the heart of the matter. So um, Hannah, I'm going to ask you first. Talk about your own expectations for yourself and, and what that meant to you. And then also just your family and everyone around you as you got more and more successful as a debater. Yeah, for sure. Um, let's see. I think really going into the activity, I never really knew how well I would do. It was something that I just really wanted to be able to have more practice with like strong communication. And I think learning about the world by actively using our knowledge to understand topics that were really complex was something that really appealed to me about the activity. Um, in terms of, I guess, familial expectations, there was, it was not something that I really talked about a lot with my family. Um, it was just, you know, they knew I really liked debate for some reason. No one else in my family had a background in that, but they were very supportive of, my, of me doing the activity. That's great. And Gabby, I want to ask you the same question, just your own family culture, but just yourself and as you were getting really successful as well. Yeah, so I was definitely like the nerd of my family. I was definitely in like a family of athletes and like wow. I was always reading, like I loved history and <laughs> my parents were supportive. I was definitely the one who like put a lot of the pressure on myself. They were always like, you're doing fine. Like, why would you do more? Um, and when I joined to be, I was just like, immersed in this community and I try to talk to my parents about it and they were like what on earth are you talking about and doing every single day after school for like two hours like what is this um like why are you stressed about this um but I think they could really tell that it was important to me um it was just I think very like foreign to them um and I think you know as time went on like I think I put a lot of the pressure on myself to like continue competing and succeeding and realigning like my expectations and like what was healthy for me like as my time in debate one um it's very like internal and figuring out like when the pressure was healthy and like when it wasn't and it took some time yeah that's that's a tough one that's actually tough to to manage throughout one's whole life and career just from my own personal experience um so Sophie, I wanted to ask you, I, I noticed, I mean, it's hard not to notice that you all had multiple female coaches, it looks like, and talk to me about your experience um, with the high school quiz show and also your own sense of competition or like, how are you measuring up? Like, how was your experience? Yeah, I think um, my experience was probably pretty similar to Gabby's with debate. Um, I think my parents didn't exactly understand the high school quiz show and like, why am I doing this on Saturday nights instead of just relaxing? Um, and also, I think having these female coaches, which we have, has been really helpful um, because it took me a while to realize actually how rare that was to have to be like very gender balanced in terms of our team is like half girls, half boys, and our coaches are all female. Um, but then when we go to competitions, often it, there's one girl on the team or there's no girls and coaches are often male as well. So it was really great to have some female role models. Right. And so through your experience, you started to notice that it wasn't like that wasn't the case in other settings. Yeah. I actually had a woman coach, which is in the 1980s, kind of amazing. And she was really strong-willed and incredibly like focused on debate. And we were like this teeny little school in the middle of nowhere. And we would debate against mostly boys. And in the 80s, like, I know this is aging me, but that's okay. It was like really male. I mean, almost 100% male. So I was just happy to see, you know, there are female coaches and then you're all here with us, right? And of course, Dominique, I, I have to come to you. Your knowledge intimidates me. So I'll just be clear. That is amazing. How do you, how are you so competitive so quickly? And how did you just like get in your mind? Okay, I'm going to compete and I'm just going to be super quick and just <laughs> own your knowledge. How did that happen? Thank you. Um, I think my team really motivates me and I've always loved learning because I joined Quiz Bowl because I feel like there's 
never enough that we know and there's always more and I really love that feeling of looking on like Wikipedia for a few hours or watching a YouTube video about some random topic that will probably never come up but it was super interesting to me and that's kind of how I started getting into Quiz Bowl was finding odd articles and just reading and learning and being able to apply all that I've learned into this fast paced like buzzer team event is what really captivates me. And I love doing all of that and showing what I know. And so you just like, really, we're going up there. You're just like right on it. Cause it really, yeah. that's amazing. I mean, debate is like that too, right? Like with debate, you have to be super quick and on your feet and girl talk the film. If y'all watch it in the audience, you really need to see how quickly, you know, obviously Gabby and Hannah, but the other girls that were profiled in this film, they're just all over it. In my era of debate, it was pretty quick too. Like you had to be pretty fast, but, and actually I always have to slow myself down as a consequence now as like a public speaker. I have to always remember I'm not debating. It's so weird because I think in high school, it just gets in your bloodstream, right? And you're used to just moving really quickly, but the rest of the world, they want to be told a story and they want to, you know, just enjoy the conversation. So um, I, I was curious about, I want to just ask Abby and Hannah this. How did you feel when you saw the movie? Like, how did, I know you were filmed along your way, right? And like, how did it feel watching yourself? I'll go to you, Gabby, first. Um, I mean, it was weird because by the time I watched it, like I was out of high school, like I was in college, I was right. out of debate. Um, so I felt old, first of all, especially because I feel like a lot of the scenes in the movie, I'm like, 14, 15. So, and I was, <laughs> and, yeah. And I was like watching with my college friends who were like laughing at me. Um, but you know, what? I'm really proud of like how much I've grown throughout debate. Like, and this activity was very meaningful for me and like my development. And I, I'm really proud of my journey. So I think watching it, um, I kind of realized how far I had come from like my 15 year old self and also made me think a little bit more about like where else I have to go so yeah I, I, I it was very weird but um like a, a like a really positive like kind of a little bit both nostalgic and not viewing experience I was like oh my god I don't I Jen if anybody asked me how I got my homework done in high school especially on the weekends I went to debate tournaments like I genuinely don't know like I, I think about it like where where was that I don't know so I'm not so nostalgic for that but other parts um I definitely am. So yeah, but like a good experience. I don't know, Hannah, if you felt the same, but. Yeah, how did you feel, Hannah? Yeah, like Gabby, it had been so many years since I thought about debate. Um, going into college, I didn't do anything related to debate at all. And that was an intentional move. Um, you know, I had a bunch of different passions in high school and that I wanted to continue to pursue. And so when all of the press stuff happened for the documentary and I did my first viewing ever many years later, it was, it was crazy to see my younger self and also to see myself go through certain growing pains. And I think in the documentary, I'm like depicted pretty seriously, which was a really big shock to a lot of my close friends. I mean, in college who watched it and knew me as like a very mellow, calm person. Oh, um, wow. And yeah, it's definitely, it was definitely really crazy to, to watch and just also think about how I don't talk like I do in debate rounds in my day-to-day -day life. Like in class, it's always a conversation. When I like get into arguments with my mom, like I'm, I have this like urge to want to pick apart the like <laughs> logical fallacies, but then I have to take a step back and understand that like, you know, everyone's just trying to communicate and it's better to kind of um, assume the best uh, in everyone. And so debate was definitely a crazy time. Well, I have a 16 year old son and he's a debater and like he really does do what you just said currently, like he'll just rip apart my arguments and I'm like, I'm sorry, I'm just your mother, you know, like at a certain point, you're just like, I'm the mom, I know it doesn't make sense and you could argue it, but at the end of the day, that's good that you can hold that back in your 20s. So, all right, great. We're going to go to the next clip, which is just a terrific, um, a terrific moment in Girl Talk. I have always been taught to be obedient, I guess, and to listen and be respectful. But I never really learned how to stand up for myself or share my thoughts or just say that I disagreed with an authority figure in general. 
Well, right, or didn't, didn't your last sentence, if you're not... Even, in, like, in class, telling people that, like, I disagreed with them on a subject. Yeah, you're telling me on Pro I can save, say, four million lives. Okay, Why are you okay. telling me you'll save lives, but I'm not? It makes sense that, like, okay, like... So, so it's better history. to save four million lives than two million lives. Right. I, feel, I feel like it's the same but point that we make the other four, way. At debate, all it is is the back and forth of, like, oh, I have this idea. Well, what about this response? But what about the response to that response? So this back and forth uh, basically meant that we were almost arguing all the time, but like kind of amicable arguing. I love that. I, I really related to that, Gabby, I have to say. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you last, actually, if you don't mind, because we just heard from you. So Dominique, I'm going to start with you. Did that resonate with you or what are your feelings as you're watching that? Yeah, for sure. I that one line about how girls are raised to be obedient. I feel like that implicit bias is still here like in groups like it's not really said, but I can always kind of end up like doing the last part or like just following along with the group and I usually don't have the confidence to speak up most of the time and it really I would have to be super sure of myself before speaking out in class and that's something I've been working towards and this document kind of inspired me to be more aware and self-cognizant of when I should be speaking out and when I should be confident and be able to speak my own opinions. Mm. What about you Sophie? I'm just curious like did that resonate? Is it different for you? Yeah, I would also have to say that it really resonated because I think um, in like day to day life or just in school, like among my friends, I know some really confident girls who will speak for themselves without prompting or anything. But I think that's more of the exception than the rule. Whereas with boys, there comes like a sense of entitlement that they have a right to say what they're saying to speak out from themselves. But we have to learn it more because it's less of the societal expectation that we're given. And what helps you when you're trying to do that? Like what part of your life? Is it the quiz bowl? Is it the high school quiz show? Is it that kind of work that helps you in the rest of your life? Sophie, I'm sticking with you. Yeah, I definitely say so. I think there's, I've had a lot of opportunities, which I'm really grateful for as like extracurriculars, such as high school quiz show and debate, which have really allowed me to like become more confident in myself and be able to speak up when maybe others aren't. Yeah, I, I think that's really important. I, I, I've said this to you all before as we've been talking that one of the things for me watching this film that was so interesting and just learning more about the quiz show too, which is amazing, is just feeling like I just assume for younger women that this was just that this had moved on a little bit, right? But the same things that you all face, I face too. And the only thing I can say is that in the workplace, as you go along, it does get better, you know? And there's a lot of women now who are running things and that helps, you know? It doesn't have to be all women running things, obviously. I don't feel that way at all, but it does help to have more women emerge as leaders because that's just great for also the younger generations right and you're all part of that with me you know and this is just generational but it is really important to note you know there is progress in the workplace as you go forward so I just wanted to say that so Hannah what are you thinking when you watch that I mean you knew you've seen that but like what do you think now as you're watching that I'm just curious yeah I think back a lot to when I was a novice and all of my captains were guys. And it was really hard because, you know, everyone has a certain way of speaking and a certain culture. And so it was really trying to understand how I felt about myself, but then also make sense of how people perceived me. Um, and kind of just like trying to find a middle ground between those two things is really um, hard in high school. And then in college and after college, it's like, when I walk into a meeting room and everyone is a man and understanding how I'm perceived is something that, you know, I still think about. And I feel like I'm always walking into a debate round whenever I'm in environments like that. Everything just feels like a debate round. <laughs> That's so interesting, right? Like, and especially in the field that you're in, right? With this, just mathematics and com computer science, I'm assuming has a lot of growth in the gender space to grow more equitable. Um, you know, for me, just running a big investigative um, 
series, you know, for Frontline, which is really identified as being male. I've shared with you guys that like when I walk into a room, people are always surprised that I'm a woman because my name is not gender specific, right? Rainy could be a male name. And I've just learned that when people are surprised that I run Frontline, I just stay steady and I smile. I let them recover and we move on. And it's just, it's literally to a T to a person. It could be a woman even. So, you know, I talk about our own biases as well, right? That people assume that I would be a man, right? And so it's just one of these interesting experiences I have, even, even with so many years of experience. So, all right, Gabby, you're many years older than that moment, but how are you feeling now? Like when you watch that, are you like, okay, I've, I've combated this or do you still struggle? I think it's a constant, like, I I think I had a big learning curve and debate, like, um, I think I became more aware of that, like, I, I, I became more aware of the fact that, like, I was almost afraid of trying and failing, um, that I was a little too focused on, you know, being polite and not making people upset, and I think I got a lot better through debate, because I think, like, intellectual confidence, like, mm. like, at least made me more capable of, like, being comfortable, like trying and, um, you know, sticking up for myself and, and, and speaking out. Um, but I mean, I don't think I'm, I'm there yet. Um, things I, I become more comfortable. In, like, I feel like I've become more, much more comfortable. Like I'm a senior now. I feel very comfortable speaking in class and knowing that it might not be the smartest thing everyone's ever, anyone's ever heard, but that's okay. Uh, but there are other moments where I feel like kind of my 14 year old self creep back in a little bit. And it's like a little bit of a battle of pushing forward, but I'm still 22. So I still got some time, but um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, I got some time. Um, but I think it's something I'm still working on, um, like asserting myself and not falling back into the trap of like doing what's safe and what's comfortable for other people. So. Yeah, I think that's the constant battle. And I think women face it their whole lives, likely if they're, and some women maybe don't, amazing, great for them, you know? <laughs> Even in my position, I, I face questions like that. Okay, so we have a great question from Ferry R from Lincoln. Um, and uh, Ferry says the film was inspirational, thank you. Um, and she, they said, my questions are as follows. Why do you think you gravitated towards debate? I'll start with that. And that's to Gabby and Hannah. And then there's a quiz show question too. I, I can go first, Hannah. Um, I, so this is so random. I remember I, I knew coming out of middle school, I think like a lot of middle school girls, I had a lot of difficulties with friends and, you know, I knew I wanted like a new environment, new people. And I kind of wanted to explore my nerdiness that I felt like was like not as accepted in that time um so I was trying out a couple of different things and I told myself I was going to try a lot of things and join a bunch at the beginning but I joined debate and I was just like immediately sucked into this like a very immersive like community environment that really made me want to thrive and succeed and made me want to show up every day and made it hard to do a lot of other things initially but made it work but uh, I was really drawn to like the in, the energy and like the excitement and that everyone seemed to really want to get to know me and have me be a part of things. And um, I really enjoyed like learning, like the log like the growth I got um, like intellectually and um, like the different debate topics. That was my first introduction to politics. So it was all for me just like really exciting. I think I think completely differently now because of debate and I was really excited about that. So. Yeah, I don't know about you, Hannah, but it was me. Yeah, for for me, I growing up, I was incredibly shy. Like I could not even like talk to new kids or people. And it was always really scary to publicly speak. And so in middle school, I actually did speech, which was um, a lot more theatrical. You know, you have your little binder, you read your stories, you have different voices for your characters. And that was a huge learning curve for me. Um, I'm glad there are no recordings of me doing speech because I feel like everyone would be so shocked to see me do that. And I did fairly well, but then going into high school, I knew I had this stronger passion for like current issues and um, trying to meld together everything I was learning in the classroom and actually be able to practice communicating about serious issues. Um, and so I think that's what drove me into debate. And 
Um, it was an incredible environment. There was so much of a rush, you know, like I never got tired when I was at tournaments because it was just like, go, go, go. And I think that's something that didn't exist in like the traditional classroom setting. And so I stuck with it and it has opened so many doors to me and has really changed the trajectory of my life. Like I'm a lot more confident because of that activity. And I love talking to people and meeting new people. Oh, that's awesome. Thank you for sharing that. Dominique, what about you and in, in your your quiz bowl work, but also the high school quiz show and everything? Uh, well, I kind of grew up with high school quiz show and that was kind of how I got into it. I always saw it on the TV. My sister competed on the show. So I grew up with high school quiz show. And then in high school, I joined academic decathlon and that kind of encouraged me to keep learning. There's like seven like objective topics where we have to learn all ranging from like economics to science. And one part of academic decathlon was the speech. So kind of similar to Hannah, I, we also had to do like a five minute speech at every competition and then like a two minute impromptu one. And that kind of gave me inspiration to like talk more, to kind of practice public speaking and get out of my comfort zone and learn how to present myself to others. And from there, that learning with Quiz Bowl is that that's kind of where it's all started. Nice. And, and what about you, Sophie? Um, well, I think for going into Quiz Bowl, I didn't really know much about it when I was younger. Honestly, I don't think I'd heard of Quiz Bowl until like high school, like maybe even sophomore year. Um, but a lot of my friends were involved with it, actually, like Dominique and some other friends. And so they encouraged me to join and to start coming to meetings. And I did. And it was really fun. And it felt good to like exercise like knowledge mm -hmm. itself, um, just outside of like having to know it for grades. Um, and I thought that was really rewarding. So I kept coming back. And as for debate, um, that was also something where it's like, I didn't really know what I was getting into. <laughs> I, um, I kind of just showed up like the first meeting freshman year of high school because I thought debate was thing, uh, something that like smart people do. And, um, and then I, when I went there, like all the, the upperclassmen were really inspiring and I was kind of awestruck by them because yeah. I thought they were super cool and really smart. And I just kept coming back too. Well, you just teed up the next question and I'm gonna, I'm gonna go to Dominique on this first. So a great question from Peggy Farron. Um, do you have any female role models or someone from your personal life or just someone from another area that you look up to? And Dominique, I'll go to you first because you're gonna be like so quick. <laughs> Hi, Ms. Farron. Oh, that, that's our coach. <laughs> So, oh, um, oh no, that's a setup. <laughs> that's your coach. <laughs> uh, didn't expect that question, but hello. Um, I would say one of my role models is like my sister and my mom. They are both like women in STEM. They've always encouraged me wow. to go into STEM and always encouraged me to ask questions. We did experiments like when I was like a toddler about like extracting mm -hmm. DNA from strawberries or like exploding volcanoes. And that was always my gateway into science and they've always encouraged me to keep trying persevere through challenges because they did they also went through challenges when my mom immigrated and they've taught me how to persevere and how to be confident in a room where maybe I'm the minority as a female in a classroom nice okay Gabby what about you you had time to think <laughs> I know, I know. I'm not as speedy as the quiz bowlers, but um, like, Whoosh. okay, I know, I know, no button to press. Um, I mean, my mom, easy answer, but um, so I think maybe, I mean, my mom for just like supporting me and really encouraging me and like listening to me as I talk about debate, like yeah. she's always really pushed me and encouraged me. Um, but then beyond that, I feel like the other members of the team, like when I was in high school, I, when I was a freshman, I like looked, really looked up to like, I, I'm, I'm, I'm like Hannah, like I was lucky. I had two female captains um, and that was like really important for me feeling welcomed and like something to look forward to. Like Hannah herself, you know, all the, all the female upperclassmen at the time were really like big role models for me and like showing a path and like providing me support and like show, showing me how 
it's done in terms of like being successful in debate and you know and, and taking some of those lessons into like life and what they do after so um yeah that's cool okay Hannah what about you I also have to go with my mom um you know she's just an incredibly inspiring person to me like I think about the way that she had to go through life when she was my age and it was so drastically different than my my privileged experience like her both of her parents are deaf and when she was a refugee after the Vietnam War she was the middle child but the one that advocated for everyone in the family like she was the one like talking to government officials to doctors to anyone and was still also learning the language at the same time and so I think a lot about like the the struggles that my mom and both of my parents have gone through and I I try to kind of carry that with me whenever I make decisions that's like so nice for me to hear as a mom but just like that's that's lovely okay Sophie what about you um, yeah, apart from like my mother, who's really helped me and supported me in a lot of ways, um, I would have to agree with Gabby that I think look a lot of upperclassmen, especially in um, debate and academic decathlon have been very inspiring to me because it's just I think this might be exceptional or maybe it's normal now. I don't really know. But most of the like the smartest people that I've known and the best leaders that I've known the most con or not the most confident but like the best leaders the best at managing clubs and different things have all been women and like female upperclassmen um which I really loved and they're they've been people that I could really look up to and also people who I could just talk to about things and I wasn't like super intimidated about it um yeah well, that's awesome. I was thinking, I was listening to you all and I was thinking, you know, I have a daughter and she faces a lot of special ed needs. And I was like, you know, who she inspires me because of the way that she has to learn differently and she still does it. And I'm just like, that's amazing. So what you all are describing are like challenges and it's actually at the heart of it is resiliency, right? Um, really like you, you know, Hannah, you describe your mom, like that's true resiliency. So with that, we're going to watch a really wonderful part of the film, uh, which actually gets to this issue. So thanks for the questions from the crowd. It's really working well. Thanks. Not a lot of people on the team, like the Newton's Activate team, know this about me, that like, you know, my parents were refugees after the Vietnam War. Like my dad went to college at the age of 33. And growing up, like seeing people blatantly discriminating against my parents just because they had an accent, that just really angered me because I knew how captivating they were in their native tongue. I really value the ability to express my thoughts and talk about the things that matter to me because of my parents' experiences. Being able to speak and to communicate is almost like a privilege to me. Now, I just really love that you shared that in that film. I think it's so important, Hannah, that you did that. And I really appreciate that you were so open with that because it was um, really, really uh, important. So Dominique, I'm gonna go to you. Do, you, do When you're watching that, what are you thinking? I just love to get you to all like share your own thoughts watching Hannah. Yeah, I also really resonated because my family is also Vietnamese and they also immigrated. Mm -hmm. So my grandpa is, and my family moved over. And I remember one story, um, my mom, I don't know if this is an exaggeration, but she said the only toy she could bring over was a Rubik's cube. And that Rubik's cube has been passed down from my sister now to me. And I've always, wow. and I've never knew how to solve it until one day we were, my grandpa, my mom and I were together and I saw my mom solve it. And I was like, that's me, I need to learn it. So like the three of us, we bonded over this Rubik's Cube. And from there, I've learned about how they moved um, over, how they moved apartments multiple times and how they always wanted a good education. And they've always, might not have had the opportunities, but they've always encouraged me to also, again, keep learning. And um, my grandpa 
speaks English relatively well, but he was a huge fan of music and art. And mm -hmm. his way of showing his love and his care was not really by speaking, but was by showing. So he, I grew up on like classical music and going to art museums. And that's something that I've kept near and dear to me because that's one connection that we have. Mm -hmm. Oh, I love that. And Sophie, what about you? Yeah, I thought it was really inspiring what Hannah was saying. Um, my mom immigrated from India when she was in her 20s for education. And I think we're relatively privileged or she has been relatively privileged because she grew up speaking English. And it's kind of inverse. I, I really like what Hannah was saying about um, like the privilege of being able to speak um, because she can speak very well in English but her mother tongue Tamil is not as good and she, she can't read it and uh, or speak it super well so I can't really speak it or read it um, and when we go back to India it's I can feel the gaps mm -hmm. sort of between the cultures and I feel like just in the sense that like Hannah talks about like the really the importance of speaking English and the not having an accent and really kind of distancing yourself from your own culture in order to be a part of this society sort of separates people where, from where they come from. And I've really felt that. So I really love that clip. Yeah. And I would say like my husband actually, his father is from Arissa and, and he really actually didn't learn um, his father's language also from India. And it was one of these, it was a regret, you know, that he didn't speak his, you know, father's language. And it's just really interesting, you know, passing language down and the privilege of speaking. I, I just love that. Hannah, did you have any other thoughts now with some years passing? Yeah, um, it was crazy watching that clip for the first time like a year or two ago, and I didn't even realize I shared that. <laughs> um, and I guess I one thing that I really think about a lot is how when my parents were my age, their ability to speak um, kind of helped them solve issues where the stakes were much higher than um, the stakes have ever been in my life. Like with my mother, the stakes were getting her family safe to the United States. And my dad's stakes at the time when he was in his 20s was being able to communicate effectively through as he was passing through different countries as a refugee and like was on a boat for five days and was communicating with the people on the boat and the ship captain in order to, I guess, save his own life. And I think about, you know, people talk a lot about intergenerational trauma and like what that does, but I also think a lot about intergenerational values. I think my parents, before they had me, made the ultimate sacrifice of, you know, coming to a country where English was not their native language and they made the ultimate sacrifice of their discomfort for my comfort. Um, and so, you know, I think a lot about how my life has been so nice. I've had the best life ever because of my parents. And I think using my voice in order to help people, like they've helped people around them, um, and also to help my own family is something that is really, really important to me. That's, that's really wonderful. And like, you'll carry that obviously now throughout your whole life, right? It's not just a moment. So, so one thought that I had was, since you're all here together, is do you have questions for each other? And Gabby, you're very curious, I can tell. So I'm going to start with you. Do you have any questions for the other panelists? God. Um, okay. Um, I guess, Sophie, I think you said you do debate and quiz bowl. I guess I'm curious, like, how those two activities, like, how you see the overlap and the differences and kind of like, what you've gained from each of them if they like if doing one helps you with the other and vice versa you know yeah so I think my experience with debate at my school was very different from yours in the film um our debate club isn't as structured we don't really have funding to go to tournaments and things um and also it's just more like relaxed that's how it kind of was set up when I entered the school and that's how it still is so it's a lot more like discussion, but I think it's it's still like public speaking in a sense. And we do have like more formal debates as well. Um, and I think debate itself has like influenced me to like put myself out there more, um, which is sort of 
how I got into Quiz Bowl because I was kind of going out on a limb trying something I hadn't before. And I think it's also like debate makes me more like confident in speaking, but Quiz Bowl is more of like a competitive aspect, which I think I've always had, but it's harder to express when you're not really confident. And debate's given me that confidence where I can express it more. That totally makes sense. Um, I definitely felt my confidence like really grow from debate. And yeah, I got very lucky to have the funding to be able to go to tournaments. But I could like, I feel like any sort of debate is like very valuable. And like in some ways, I see how that could have been more valuable um, in certain aspects. Um, that like our team didn't have um, in the relaxed sense. So it's definitely interesting to hear. Okay, what other questions do you have for each other? And then I have one more question from the crowd. I have one question. Um, I remember a lot in the documentary, they talked about like how you dress and how that is, and I feel like it's unnecessary, but that's like a requirement. And how, what is your experience with that mindset? And have you used it or do you still have that in after college or during college now? Um, I, I can, I can, um, I think I do still have it. I think Hannah said earlier, and I think it's true. I think after debate, I'm much more aware of perception, um, and how I'm perceived. And I think it has definitely affected the way that I dress in general and the way that I realize like appearance, unfortunately, like has an effect. And I kind of wish I didn't think this way. Um, but, you know, there was the sense of realizing that, like, on the days where I felt like I was tall enough um, when I was in my heels, and if I felt like I looked professional, people perceived me as older, as more professional. I think, like, I'm, I'm a senior, I've been applying to jobs, like, that attitude has kind of followed me, um, and I kind of wish it wasn't the case. Like, I, I like the COVID idea, but not. I don't know about you, Hannah, but that's me. I, I think I'm forever changed a little bit in terms of dressing, so. Yeah, I feel like COVID did make a really big impact on, you know, the importance of your clothes, which is a very superficial thing inherently, but um, I'm, it was covered in the documentary, but, you know, all the girls were spending so much more time having to, like, straighten their hair because they thought that maybe not having straight hair was not professional enough and some judges have implicit biases that come up that you know it's really hard to you know you want to break those implicit biases down but then you also you can't say anything when you're in a round and so um yeah the the way we dress unfortunately does still impact a lot of people um, but you know, things are changing. You know, there's lots of work environments that have very casual dress and there's a lot more representation about the different types of clothing people bring into collaborative spaces, um, which is a really great change. Yeah, I can say just professionally speaking, you know, because actually it's great that you were you talked about that because one of the questions was about do we think about how we dress and present, you know, and and the question was like, do I too? And the question is, of course, right? I think about that, but I have embraced like very curly hair and I've just made, I'm not always curly, but I have just made the decision that I'm going to like wear my natural hair as opposed to always straightening it. But in my twenties, when I was sort of in New York city and the networks, I was like, okay, I need to, everybody had like very six straight hair. Right. And so I really became conscious of like, you know, having hair that might not be sending the message. And I just decided, well, through my life, I'm going to wear more natural hair, which is such a funny thing, but it's so interesting how we all make decisions, right? About how we want to be, um, you know, perceived in the world at large and what, what kind of message are we sending? And I think to Hannah's point, a lot is changing in that regard, which makes me really happy too. Did you have something else to add, Gabby? A, a little bit because I think it's so interesting because in in a way it's like kind of like like a privilege I feel like once you've risen through the ranks to be able to make those decisions but then once you make those decisions like those below like a lower on the totem pole like view you making those decisions it has an effect it's like oh this is okay now so I think that's definitely interesting and like 
how the changes like you yourself make, especially as you rise into like positions of power can have an effect. Cause I know every time I've started an internship, I kind of walk in and I'm like, okay, what's the norm? Like, it, like is this okay? Like, or, like in terms of like being professional. So like seeing what other people do um, like in higher up positions is always like impactful in that sense of like, you can wear your hair natural and like, that's okay. It's interesting. I will tell you, because, you know, you are thinking like all the time about this stuff. And I, I appreciate that you all shared that. And I, I wish that it wasn't the case too, Gabby, to your point, you know, you do wish that. But at the end of the day, like we, we do come to peace. And I do think you're going to see the workplace is so much more open. Fingers crossed to how all sorts of different people, just not just obviously me as a white woman, but BIPOC, women in there they're just really really much more and are in my ranks expressive you know with what they wear and their hair and just trying to be more of ourselves too so um sophie or dominic did you have anything to add to that as well uh i can add a bit especially in stem i can talk um dressing is not as like like not as regulated I feel like it's okay to be casual but there's definitely fewer female in leadership especially in computer science and that's been in challenge and it's been there's a lot of improvement especially with girls who code and the club that at our school that we founded um it's really amazing to see all these different women from like different grades and different backgrounds and being able to code and not having to think about like how we dress and how we have to act as a group with each other is really welcoming and it also prepares us and creates this network so I don't want to think about what I have to wear in a meeting or anything but I think we're taking the right steps so that we don't have to worry as much about this bias right on thank you and Sophie anything else yeah I just have to really agree with Dom Dominique that I think there's a lot of change that's going on um but it's still like when there's like formal dress events I always notice it's like with like science fair or just if there's a concert or something like that I feel like there's always much more effort that the girls put in than the guys like you can just tell by looking at them like like I straighten my hair uh girls put on makeup and like have to like carefully pick out dresses and skirts and things and tights and heels but guys can just throw on a dress shirt and they're done and it's it's kind of painful to see a little bit but I can you can see that it's changing and it's also we have more wiggle room now than I think in the past which is very liberating yeah no I think that's right so you have all been amazing. I really can't wait to watch your careers. I was thinking about that as I was reading about your backgrounds and getting to know you and of course watching the film and the quiz show. Um, you know, I'm really excited for you and your paths forward and I hope you stay in touch and you keep in touch with GBH and all of us and I want to also thank um, Eleanor Hong and uh, David who's producing this event and all the really special people at the quiz show Hillary. Um, and also, of course, um, the World Channel, who I think the world of. So now we're going to say goodnight. Thank you for all your questions from the audience. And we're going to share some information about how you can see the show, the first of all, Girl Talk, but also more world programming and also the quiz show. So if you hold on, you'll see that on the slate. And thanks for all of your time.